Hello all and welcome uh, to this event. I'm Randy Stakeman. I am an Associate Professor of History and Africana Studies Emeritus. Now, Emeritus is Latin for, yeah, he used to work here. <laughs> you know. And they've asked me to introduce two men who, if you know anything about Bowdoin, don't need any introduction, right? Uh, so I feel a little bit superfluous. Uh, I met um, Clayton about four years ago, he, uh, just as he was starting his presidency. I met him in a stairwell at uh, Hawthorne Longfellow. I was going down and he was coming up. There's a metaphor in there, isn't there? <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and so you know, we, we, we talked for about five minutes and uh, I hadn't realized what an intelligent and kind man he was. Um, but to be fair, neither did he. So <laughs> uh, I gave him my um, wisest and sagest advice as he was entering his, his new job. I told him, don't screw it up. <laughs> Although looking back, I might not have said screw. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, and he apparently hasn't, uh, <laughs> at least so far. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I want to warn him uh, before he says anything to you guys, about you guys, because I've been talking to you guys, right? And you guys not only love Bowdoin and have spent your time and uh, your money uh, to get here, but you'll talk truth to power, you know, at the drop of a hat. <laughs> and it's because uh, Africana Studies course has trained you and Bowdoin taught you. Um, <laughs> and age has made you willing. Uh, <laughs> the other fellow that we're talking, uh, that will be speaking to you tonight is uh, Kenneth Cheneau, who uh, I hadn't met until yesterday because we just don't move in the same circles. I, uh, I mean, he was the leader of one of the major financial institutions in the world, right? And I'm unemployed, right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, since he has become uh, president of American Express Emeritus, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have a lot more in common. <laughs> Right, I mean, he has, has now started uh, his uh, venture capitalist firm, right? Uh, and apparently my son thinks I have too, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. We'll skip that joke. <laughs> All right. But I also want to point out that Ken has been one of the strong supporters of Bowdoin College and an example of um, the best we can produce. Uh, I like to think of it in terms of the three I's, right? Intelligence, ingenuity, right, and integrity. When you add to that uh, some human decency and some compassion for others, you have the kind of leadership that we can and should have, right? The kind of leadership that is so lacking in our politicians. Mm. So, uh, I promised Rhody Lloyd I'd keep this short, and uh, so I'll get out of the way so you can uh, listen, right, to Ken and to Clayton. I'd just like to say to Randy's comment about not screwing things up, you always have to add, not yet. So. <laughs> um, Ken, welcome. Welcome back. Glad to be here. Um, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, so I'm going to um, engage in a bit of a conversation with Ken, do some Q&A, uh, and then we'll leave time at the end for questions from all of you. You can ask the really hard stuff, and I'll do the softball stuff, but uh, um, maybe not so much. Yeah. But, but, um, Whatever you want to do. OK, good. Yeah. Uh, so, Let's go back to your senior year. You wrote an honors thesis here called The Black Man at Bowdoin. 
Um, why did you write it? What, did, what, what motivated you to do it? What was driving you? What did you conclude at that time about that work? First of all, what I, I think is really important are the facts. And uh, John Hope Franklin, the renowned African-American historian, and I'll paraphrase this, said, we have a obligation or responsibility to tell the unvarnished truth. Uh, and I really do believe that if we're able to make progress, we have to understand the truth. And Bowdoin had made a very big deal about having the first black graduate. Uh, and other colleges wouldn't admit it until the 50s uh, that they had a black there. Uh, so I think um, Williams and Amherst uh, sort of fessed up that they had a few. Uh, who were there, uh, and they actually had one or two that graduated before John Brown Russworm. The issue, and I think this is very important for America, is if you're going to have reconciliation, you really have to understand the truth. And so Bowdoin had the first, for a while, black graduate, and they didn't have another one until 1910. And um, from 1910 to 1950, they had 17 or 18 African-American graduates. Half of them were Phi Beta Kappa. And half of them could not live on the campus of Bowdoin College. And so it was a very challenging experience. And for me, uh, it gave me tremendous motivation. There was anger. Certainly, but there was also a view that they were pioneers. And what was impressive when I was doing this study and disappointing is between 1950 and 1970, I couldn't get anybody else who was black to talk to me about having graduated from Bowdoin. For some, it was such an unnerving experience that they did not want to revisit their years at Bowdoin. There were others, uh, and I would just cite a few, Herman Dreer, who the year we graduated in the class of 73, I went to the administration. And I should also say that when I was writing, before I wrote the thesis, uh, several members of the administration spoke to me and asked me not to write it. Uh, and I needed to be careful. Uh, and that was not something I followed. Uh, it was about the truth. And I think that Herman Dreer finished in 1910. Uh, as I said, he was Phi Beta Kappa. There is some debate whether he was second or first in his class. Uh, but just like another black uh, graduate, John Dean, uh, who uh, at the time was one of the first people to get all A's uh, in every class, who finished number one, was not allowed to get the number one designation because he was black. And he became number two, the salutarian of the class. So I think what is, what's important about this is Bowdoin had a, um, and New England colleges uh, did not step up. That's the reality. And from a historical perspective, both for whites and blacks, one of the points that really uh, had an impact on me that I firmly believe to this day is that after emancipation, if we'd just been given the rights of anyone else, we wouldn't have needed any help. And so when someone tells me that they have an issue with affirmative action, you've got a problem with me. Because the reality is that we deserve that opportunity. So what I would say is, and I think I've said this to you, Clayton, Bowdoin was a defining experience for me. It changed my life. And I'm very grateful to Bowdoin. But I think it was very important to me for Bowdoin to deal with its history and to understand, and this event I think is tremendous, but to understand its responsibility. 
that it has a tremendous responsibility. You think about the human potential that was literally wasted. Someone like Herman Dreher, who in fact at 48 went back to the University of Chicago and got a PhD, had a law degree, and was a minister. But he really could not, and he told me this, I could not operate the way I'd like to in life. And that was true of a number of blacks who graduated from Bowdoin, and even until this present day. So the battle continues, and it's important that all of us take responsibility for making a change. As you just want to stay on this topic for just sure. a second, Ken, but as you've just talked about the uh, the paper itself was critical. The administration was nervous. That would be a, that's yeah. a code word. That would administrative be code yeah. word. Yes, yeah. right. Um, uh, but when you, when you worked on this with faculty, yes. and they were your advisors, to talk a little bit about that relationship, the, the guidance yeah. they gave you, how they helped you, what It what was that an was absolutely great relationship. Um, I really uh, developed very close relationships with my professors, and I majored in history. I probably took every course in the department, European history, American history, ancient history, and some of my professors, Jim Bland, uh, was outstanding. Uh, Professor Whiteside was incredible. I don't know if Dan um, Levine is, is here, but uh, he was uh, my advisor, and he was just terrific. Uh, and one of the professors I was very close to taught European history was somebody named John Carl. Uh, and all of these professors took a great deal of interest uh, in me. Uh, and I think, as I've told uh, Clayton, uh, my life has not been a straight line. Uh, I don't believe in straight lines, uh, at least for me. Uh, it wouldn't have worked. And so. When I was in high school, my focus was sports. I really wanted to be a basketball player and a soccer player. And um, uh, I went, uh, I was first going to go to University of Vermont. Uh, but then I found out when I went to see the coach, uh, when I was leaving, that they had a minstrel show, which they had every year. And he said, but it's only one weekend. Uh, and so uh, I left. And I said, I'm obviously not going to go there. And uh, then I went to Springfield College, uh, and they had in Division II a really good soccer team. Uh, and uh, I thought I would do that. And then in the spring semester, uh, 53 black students, including me, we took over a dormitory uh, for several days, um, went to court, uh, and uh, uh, we were actually convicted. Um, uh, and uh, but. We were able to work out a deal that our record over time would be expunged. And I had my headmaster uh, of the school I went to, uh, Peter Curran, who was an Your alumnus high of high my school. high school, uh, of Bowdoin. And he, we had a very close relationship. And he's someone who had told me, look, if you would ever apply yourself, because I was a student who only studied things I liked. Uh, and it didn't matter what class, if I wanted to read something, I'd read it whatever it was. And I sort of woke up my junior year uh, somewhat, not all the way. But um, he really said, if you ever applied yourself, I think you could do unbelievable things. And he literally uh, came up uh, one day and said, we're going up to Bowdoin. Uh, and I had an interview. Uh, and Dick Mole, uh, who brought in most of my class of 73, 74, who was terrific, um, uh, let me in. And actually, someone from the administration at Springfield uh, called Dick and said, you shouldn't let this person in. This, look what he did. And Dick said, he's in. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that really, uh, what Peter Kern did for me, uh, what Bowden did for me, uh, I was on a mission. And, uh, and it really made Bowdoin had made an incredible difference in my life. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit of a preamble, but I wanna link part of this conversation to the next thing. I wanna switch to, to your career uh, mm -hmm. after Bowdoin and, um, and the notions of leadership and values and so right. forth. But uh, as I think everyone in the room knows, you've had a storied career in business. Uh, you've been one of the most, you are one of the most admired 
uh, uh, leaders in t late 20th century and early 21st century society more broadly, you're one of the few, very, very few uh, persons of color to lead one of the most important companies in the world. Um, uh, as you think about uh, leadership, talk first about this issue of not having a straight line, of, you know, that journey, right? right? So I think we look at leaders and we say, well, they you know, got all straight A's in college, in high school and then in college, and it's well-planned and well-mapped out. And so how does, how does life intervene in that? How did life intervene for you? And then I want to morph into values and how we think about that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I obviously get asked this question a lot. And, Darn. Uh, but it's a good question. Okay, good. It's a good right. question, Clay. Right. Um, God. But, you know, as I've reflected, uh, when, when I was actually pretty young, one of the things I wanted to do was really try to make a difference in our society. And, um, and I think ultimately I wouldn't have characterized it this way when I was in high school or college, is really to make a meaningful difference in people's lives. That has become a touchstone for me uh, in business. And uh, I didn't pursue a business degree. People have said, well, did you plan this out? How did you make a switch? from law, I said, I wasn't even thinking about it. I was practicing law for two years. It was sort of okay, uh, wasn't bad. And uh, a friend of mine uh, who was at Bain & Company said, he always impressed me as someone who could do well in business. Uh, and um, we were, I was newly married, uh, my wife and I, and it was a free weekend in Boston. So we said, look, uh, consulting firm, I didn't really know what a consulting firm did, but what I've always tried to do is put myself in environments where uh, I thought I'd be challenged. And what impressed me at Bain, there was uh, almost a startup mentality. The firm was only four or five years old at the time. People were really energized, were really bright. Uh, I liked the pace uh, and the dynamism. And then uh, what they gave me, they said, look, um, in our system, you know, we're going to throw you right in. Uh, I didn't know accounting. I said, Here's some books, uh, and so I'd work during the day and do uh, and study uh, at night, uh, and it was a great experience for me. And then I wasn't planning to leave Bain, and then Lou Gerstner, who, uh, from a business standpoint, is one of the icons of business. Uh, uh, he really turned around IBM. And uh, he was running the largest business at Amex. And uh, he was looking for some low-level people in um, strategic planning. And so I went there. But I think what was important, one of the reasons why I went there was uh, what I started to formulate in my mind is that the next civil rights frontier was really in business. Uh, that we needed to be in a range of roles. And uh, I really did want to be in the room where things happen. And I didn't want to be in a situation where I wanted to be the giver rather than someone just asking, you know, help me. Uh, and uh, so I think the first thing for me is one of my maxims of leadership is that um, if you want to lead, you have to be willing to serve. And I really do believe in the servant leader model. Uh, and I think what you should be doing as a leader uh, is you should be serving people. You should be serving your customers. You should be serving your investors. You should be serving your employees. Uh, and that's a mantra that I really have followed. And then for me, uh, when I was around 30, again, I love history, uh, and I uh, paraphrased a quote from Napoleon, which I'll preface, I don't want to wind up that way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it is literally a, a quote I, I, I think about every day, uh, that the role of a leader is to define reality and give hope. And it is very hard to define reality sometimes in the world we live in, but sometimes people focus so much on the reality that they get stuck. They can't move. 
And so the first step is the situational analysis, which is very important. But then how do you put the strategy and tactics together that will give people hope? That's what leaders need to do. That's frankly, certainly we're not getting it here in the US uh, with the current president, but the reality is around the world, I think people are dealing in negatives. Uh, and it's one thing to say there's a problem. Let me be very clear, very focused on identifying a problem and being a truth teller, but that's just one part. The other part is you gotta give people hope. You gotta give them the game plan of how you're gonna move forward. So, um, so for me, Clayton, is I've never viewed, and let me be very, very clear, I've done well. Um, I'm not gonna give back the money I've earned, but I'm gonna certainly give it to people. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna give it to anybody, uh, but I'm gonna- and Wait I, a minute, what are you saying? Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. Uh, but but the, the philanthropic side is very, very strong, but I wouldn't be in business if I didn't think I was making a meaningful difference in people's lives. And that's really what has motivated me and will continue to motivate me. So on the hope for a minute, which is right. such a profound challenge, let's go to a moment where this had had to be uh, the, the most important thing you could do. So shortly after you became CEO, 9-11 uh, occurs. You, the headquarters for American Express is a block from ground zero, if, if that. Uh, so every, the, the, the country's in a state of, of, of confusion and panic uh, and, and terror. And you, for the company, it, that must have been amplified by orders of magnitude. So how, how do you think about, how did, how did you think about what your responsibilities were, and in particular, how did you give the company and your employees hope in that moment? So, just to tell a little bit of a story um, that was a really tragic story is, uh, I was in Salt Lake City uh, when the attack happened, and uh, I had, was on a conference call with people at our headquarters, and I had the TV on but the sound off, and uh, I was talking to people in a conference room facing the World Trade Center. So I saw the plane hit and then the screams in the conference room. Uh, and our first uh, 12 floors of the building were damaged. We lost 11 of our colleagues who were working in the World Trade Center. And, um, and I, it was, I couldn't fly back because they wouldn't allow you to, to fly for a period of time. Uh, and uh, I was able to do a conference call uh, and my management team gathered in someone's apartment because everyone had to evacuate the building. And uh, so I didn't have much time really to think about what I would do and sometimes you just gotta go with the feeling of what you need to do. And so I first said is the first priority uh, are our people and uh, our customers and anyone that we can help, whether they're customers of ours or not. And we have a very significant customer service and travel infrastructure around the world. And I said, look, just help anybody in need. Uh, they don't have to be a customer of ours. Second, we got to account for every employee uh, who worked in the area, and we were in several areas, several buildings, in, including our headquarters. And then I said, um, let me give you the harsh reality. Uh, you will be judged severely on every action you take. And I want you to lead with compassion, but I also want you to lead with decisiveness. And if you fail to lead, I won't even have to re remove you. The organization will lose confidence. And that is really tough. That's really challenging, but you're in that leadership position. And then I said, but I will do everything I can to support you, to work with you, alongside you. We all are in this together. And I got back to New York two days later, uh, and I remember standing on some desks. We had 
I was like a circuit rider because we had, we had to go, relocate to 10 different offices. And I went around to each office and really talked to them about the fact that American Express was not defined by a building. Uh, it was defined by our people. And uh, we were surmounted. And then what I realized a week later is, and let me also say, as soon as I got back, I went to all of the victims' families. And that was incredibly emotional uh, for me, for them. Uh, and because part of, I think, when you're a leader, you've got to be in the moment. And you need to show people that you care deeply about them. And then what I realized is I needed to get as many people together as possible. So we took out Madison Square Garden. And um, uh, I got all of the employees in the tri-state area. Uh, and I just spoke to them. Uh, I remember one of our PR people said, you know, um, uh, do you want some talking points? I said, how, how do you do talking points? I got to just get up and talk to the people. And what I tried to do was give them a sense, again, of reality, because our business travel volumes dropped 60% uh, post 9-11. Uh, the card business was severely impacted. And the vultures were out there saying Amex, you know, uh, it was unclear whether they could get through this. Uh, and I t gave them the facts. And then I said, here are some of the things we're doing. But then I said, um, I want to talk to you about how I really feel about you. And uh, there were one or two family members there of the victims. And I went out and embraced them uh, and uh, told them I loved them, uh, that I was there for them. Uh, and anyone who needed counseling uh, to get through the challenge. And then what I think is there's the other side of being decisive and being compassionate. One of the things I recognized was that the business was going to be fundamentally changed. And so I decided that we were going to have to lay off 15% of our workforce. So you can imagine what people said to me, Ken, people are emotionally traumatized. How can you do this? And I said, I can do it because I don't think we're going to have a company if we don't take some of these moves. But we're going to do it in a, in a compassionate way. We're going to try to help relocate people. But we're going to go out. I'm going to go out. And we're going to talk to people face to face. And in our company, one of the things we do that is aligned with your compensation is you are judged uh, from employee feedback. Uh, and that counts for part of your compensation. So then, of course, the same people who said you can't do this said, well, you're not going to do the survey this year. And I said, we lost 11 people. There have been 3,000 people who have lost their lives. And you're worried about your comp? <laughs> no, you're going to be impacted. Uh, but what ended up happening, I think, is people understood the situation we were in we got the highest scores that we ever got prior to that time on the employee survey. Because what people said is they understood why we had to do it. Ken was straight with us. And he did it with compassion. And then the last thing, very importantly for me, is I decided we were going to move back to our headquarters after. And people said, why are you doing that? And I said, I do want to make a statement. Uh, and But I'm not going to do it if anybody's security is going to be compromised. The question was, do we go midtown New York or downtown? Had a fact-based analysis done. And people said, you could go downtown. But there was the emotional scar of that. And so I made sure we had the right security measures so that people would feel comfortable yeah. coming back. Thank you for sharing that remarkable moment, um, or moments. But yeah. um, let's. Uh, Let's just talk at a, at a higher level about, about values, and then we're going to yep. take that and morph into the, the next chapter that you've just entered here. But, but is, what are the, the values that drive you as a business leader and a leader in society? And juxtapose that to what you, not naming names, although you can do that if mm -hmm. you want, but what you see is kind of absent out there. You've talked about the hope issue at a political right. level, but from a business perspective, what, what and people don't often associate values right. with business, right? right? So there's so an oxymoron. I'm, um, there's nothing more important than values. And for me, uh, 
anyone who's worked with me knows that the most important value is integrity. And the way I've defined integrity, and I talk about it in any organization I'm involved with, is the consistency of words and actions. Because the reality is honesty is the minimum requirement. Uh, that's the minimum. But to operate with integrity, there has to be that consistency. Because words are meaningless unless they're followed with action. Uh, and if you want trust, you've got to have integrity. Uh, and I think of relationships. I'll get a little business speak here, but brands are really important to me. And people have a misunderstanding of brands, that brands are created by advertising. They're not. Brands are a cluster of values. You have a set of rational values, and you have a set of emotional values. And the best brands are the ones that have a rational and emotional connection. Just like the best people, you have a rational side and you have a emotional side. And what I think is very, very important from a leadership standpoint is you've got to engage the hearts and minds. And what I've always believed is, as a leader, you want to lead an institution and an organization that will endure. Frankly, there are a number of people who can leave for five, six, seven years. But to do it over a 10, 15, 25 year, 30 year time frame, which is what you want in a lot of institutions that endure, is you got to capture the hearts and minds. And so integrity is important to me. A second attribute that I'm very focused on that is not associated enough is I think you got to have courage. I mean, at the end of the day, to be a leader, you're going to take some risk. You know, people who think that they can be a leader without taking risk, it doesn't work. You're going to have to take some stands, unpopular stands. And you're going to have to take those stands on values. So courage is very important to me. Compassion, I believe in that strongly. Decisiveness is critical. Adaptability is very important. And the person that I have always looked to since I found out about him, the uh, person I admire the most is Nelson Mandela. Because Nelson Mandela, what people don't realize, he was compassionate, he was decisive. You know, people think of him in his elderly years as he was this very grandfatherly type of person. He was a freedom fighter. He never renounced violence, because he said, sometimes it's necessary. Uh, and so I, frankly, like people who are visionaries, but they also are practical. And they say, this is the reality. Uh, and Nelson Mandela captured the hearts and minds of people. He converted his enemies, his jail guard, for close to 25 years that he was in prison, his jail guard became his fervent follower. Uh, so I think what is really important to me from a leadership standpoint is a leader, a leader ultimately back to define reality and give hope is you're constantly transforming and innovating. And that's, again, back to Nelson Mandela, which I'm obsessed with all the leadership lessons. Here's someone incarcerated for 27 years who did not just survive, he thrived. He thrived, he came out stronger. He was more aware, and that, that comes to the last attribute, which I think is personified in Nelson Mandela, is a high level of self-awareness. And that means a high level of consciousness. Because if you're not self-aware, if you don't have a high level of consciousness, you're not going to be an enduring leader. And uh, those are the qualities that uh, I try to strive for. I certainly don't achieve those qualities. Uh, uh, but uh, I think having that aspiration uh, really motivates me tremendously. Mm -hmm. All right, let's put a place marker on that, and yeah. we'll make, come back to that. I want to um, take us now to the next chapter. So you have been. 
you are a, a firmly established member of the establishment, right? The, the business, the traditional business order. You ran American Express, one of the iconic companies. Uh, we're on the boards of Procter and Gamble and IBM. It doesn't get any more establishment than that. So you announced that you're stepping down as CEO, and you also announced that you're leaving the boards of IBM and uh, and Procter and Gamble, and you uh, have become the chairman and the, a general partner, a general catalyst, a venture private equity firm, new economy investor, and joined the boards of Facebook and Airbnb. <laughs> Total shift, right? And maybe a little bit crazy. Yes. Well, right. Right. so maybe. Uh, so there's a why that's, mm -hmm. and then there's a, cause you don't do things, you're not doing it for the money right. and you're not doing it cause you want to get written up in the wall street journal. You, so what do you hope to accomplish? What's the reason, what's the accomplishment reason that's driving that? So one is one of my phrases that I often use and I believe it's true in business and life is innovate or die. Can't stand still. You want to fight the status quo? You got to fight the status quo. Can't say I'm now the status quo. So for me, <laughs> I've never wanted to look back uh, and I want to go forward. And back to this view that um, I always believe that I had a professor at Harvard Law School named Derek Bell who uh, really focused on social justice. And I remember saying to Derek, years after I was in business is, did you think I did the right thing? And he said, I think you're still a warrior for social justice. And as I look at technology and, um, and I look at the venture world, uh, one is diversity and inclusion uh, would not be uh, a high mark uh, there. And um, that is something that's really important to me. The second thing that I've doing a lot of thinking, and I'll probably do some writing about, is technology has fundamentally changed our society and the way we do things. I mean, we were talking, I got my two uh, running buddies, uh, Jeff Canada and George Caldoun, we were talking on the way here that, um, you know, we were in college uh, for some of the students who may be here uh, before the time of cell phones. And so, <laughs> the reality is the world has just changed dramatically. and I think there needs to be a reframing of the responsibility and the role of corporations, the responsibility and the role of government, and the responsibility and the role of the academy, colleges and universities. And on the technology side, one of the things I have said to technology leaders uh, is you say you want to disrupt and transform the world, but at the end of the day, the way you look, in certain cases, you're worse than legacy companies. You're worse than legacy companies. So how are you challenging the status quo when you're not focused on changing society? And so it, um, this is something that I'm really focused on. And then on the venture, capital side, I want to work with emerging companies uh, because they're the future. And uh, the opportunity to instill the right values and what we've said at General Catalyst is we want to work with founders that are going to build companies that endure, that stand for something, uh, that have values that in fact are a focus on changing the world. And um, one of the investments that I can't mention that will be announced next week, I think will be a perfect example of a company that I think has tremendous economics, because let me be clear, I mean, the other thing I like to do is I like to win. I do like to win, uh, and I don't apologize for that, but I always say I'm gonna win with the right values uh, and the right aspirations, uh, but I also think that you can win in having a company that can generate terrific economics and make a major impact on our society. And so that's something that I'm focused uh, on doing because uh, I think that our broad society uh, needs to understand the fundamental changes. In my view, I look at if we have a big change, then what has really changed? And so, you know, what I would say is if technology has brought about major changes, have our educational systems changed 
in a fundamental way, including our colleges? Not really. It's been more incremental change. Have our governments really changed the way they govern? Not really. And corporations, are they taking a broader role in society? Not really. So if we believe a fundamental change is coming about, I think we need to be thoughtful about how the different sectors work together. And I think that is absolutely critical. And so that's part of what I see as my mission. Yeah. So I'm mindful I'm going to uh, we'll end the, my questioning in a minute, but I do want to pursue a couple of things here. As you think about the, the leaders in the new economy, the place you're in now, whatever, and the leaders in the, in the more established economy that you've left or parked, um, what are what's the, what are the main differences in their characteristics and the values by which they lead? Without naming names, unless of course you sure. want to name names, no. but uh, right. I'll stay out of that for yeah. now. Okay. Right. Uh, um, so I, I think you know, Clayton. I think it's a it's a really interesting question. So let me sort of give a little bit of context. One of the things I think with some of the newer technology companies, uh, and newer meaning there may be 15 years in existence, is they haven't done a second act yet. That's where the character really comes, is can you do the second act? All right, I ran a company that's 170 years old. Didn't start with me, that company reinvented itself. And so what's happening that you see is the so-called disruptors now have to disrupt their own model. They now have to change. And they're having real challenges of how to go about that. I think that, like in anything, uh, it's a mixed bag. I mean, there are some people who just don't get it, uh, who think that they are so brilliant uh, because they went public and they're worth several billion dollars that all of a sudden somebody has conferred on them genius status, and they're the, the wisest person in the room. And the reality is, yeah, they had a great idea. Uh, it worked, but it's not enough to endure. Uh, they're going to have to do a second or third act. So I, I really um, think that there is not a tremendous difference between what I see with legacy companies on the leadership and value side and what I see with um, the, the new uh, economy companies. I see a lot of talk on missions, but then have they operationalized that mission? Uh, and uh, some companies I think are terrific, uh, and I think some of the leaders uh, and I would name a few, but then I gotta, then you'll say, well, he left this person out, so that means he thinks they're horrible. Uh, but, but the reality is that there are some tremendous uh, young CEOs that really get it and understand this notion of trying to create a company for the 21st century uh, that will play a broader and more impactful role on society, but also people that at their core have strong values. And again, back to leadership and politics, I can deal with people who have a different political ideology than I do. Uh, I may get upset at them sometimes, but at the end of the day, I can work with them. But what I can't do, and I think this is what is happening, is I can't work with people who don't have character and don't have values, because that's at the core. And so when people tell me, well, I like this person's politics, but they're bereft of core values, but you know what? I'm going to be OK. That's not a good situation for our society. Uh, and so uh, I just fundamentally feel that part of what I try to do in any interaction that I have, particularly with CEOs, whether they are at a new or long-term company, is I really talk to them about core values. Uh, and that's critical. But what's also important is you got to win. And so what's critical, people will say, well, how can you say you got to win, but you got to have core values? 
If you're going to be a leader, you've got to manage conflicting priorities. That's part of your job as a lawyer, as, as, as a business person, is you've got to manage constructive conflict. And if you're not up to that, if you've got to say, I've got to come down on one side or the other side, that I can't win without being bad, then that's a problem. That's a problem. But if you're a human being, you should feel the tension. You should feel the tension. And, you know, sometimes what's amazing to me is some people don't feel the tension. They just say, hey, I'm going to just do what I want to do and not care about the impact. All right, we're going to uh, move to taking questions. I'm going to ask a question while we get set up. We put microphones in the front. If you just come down and, and line up if you want or uh, however. Um, but with a, I'm going to ask a shorter question maybe. Sure. But as you think about the challenge of diversity and inclusion in particular yeah. in the new economy and in the valley and so forth, one of the things that I've heard the pushback is we're a meritocracy. So what do you think when you hear that in response to the notion of why we're not as diverse as we need to be around gender or race or ethnicity or whatever? Garbage. <laughs> uh, the reality is that um, clearly there are some pipeline issues, but what I've seen, it's uh, based more on the community that you're with, and uh, people become very parochial, and they tend to just deal with people who are like them. Uh, and uh, I think a proactive effort has to be made. And so generally, what I find is uh, people don't want to make the effort, the extra effort. Uh, and uh, it has to be made, right? If you're going to make a difference in society. And so the issue is you make the extra effort in your business. If you've got an initiative that you want to accomplish, you're going to say, I'll go to the high ends to find the right people to get it done. And then when it comes to diversity, well, you know, I think that's a little bit heavy lift. I don't know if I can do that. No, it doesn't work that way. You have a responsibility, and that's why I would go back to what we talked about the history of Bowdoin for blacks, is the reality is that all that has happened, there is a responsibility and an obligation to improve our society. And it's not going to happen unless our society is more diverse. And, and I will tell you, I went through this at Amex all the time, and here's what always happens. You put underrepresented minorities in a position of leadership, guess what happens? You get more underrepresented minorities in that position. And people would say, boy, it's unbelievable. The change in four or five years, when you put so-and-so who happens to be black or so-and-so who happens to be a woman or so-and-so who happens to represent another group, um, it happens. Uh, and so I think that we have to be unyielding because of the promise of our society, uh, the promise of this country, which we haven't met. We know we're in way down from where we need to be. We've got to move this up. Uh, so I think that's part of the leadership commitment. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? I can't see faces, but go yeah. ahead. It's Mr. Cheneau, thank you so much for being here. And uh, Just call me Ken. <laughs> you make uh, me feel as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question, I was actually reviewing one of your past interviews where you said that um, trust and service uh, and security were three things that was at the core of what you did at Amex. And really, it sounds like that's a mantra that you continue with all of your business right. today. But um, for my own kind of... Um, pondering in business, trust is expensive to earn. Uh, security, whether that's co uh, protecting consumer data or otherwise, is expensive to maintain. And then uh, good cu customer service is, of course, very expensive as well. So I was wondering, how do you balance those expensive things um, while also maintaining a good product for consumers and also responding to shareholders as a public company as Amex was? No, it's, 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 it's one of those tensions that certainly is uh, very challenging. But one of my mantras, one of the things I try to do is not impose um, a lot of rules. Uh, but I always focus on principles. 
because that helps me make some of the trade-offs. So three of the principles that I use is, one, uh, whatever enterprise I'm involved with, I try to figure out a way, and my principle there is provide superior value to the customers and clients that you serve. Uh, so you can look at that in a consumer context, or you can look at that in an investor context, always looking about how do I drive more value. Second, which is critical, is everything we do. If I'm talking to a company, I say, I want you to achieve best-in-class economics. Why? I don't say short-term profits, but if you want to build something that's enduring and you want to innovate, you have to achieve best-in-class economics. That's hard, so it doesn't mean everything is best-in-class economics at the same time, but that overall goal has to be there. And then for me, because I'm a big believer in brands, if you have a brand, if you don't have a brand, then I would say from a reputation standpoint, is everything you do must support and enhance the brand. So you need to know, and for me, what that means is, what do you stand for? What does the organization stand for? And how do you ensure that you're meeting against it? But if you apply those principles, what that ends up happening is you have some real debate and you have some real tension. And then people need to see your actions. So what I would say is, people would say, Ken, this, you're asking us to do this, and this is gonna be difficult in the short term and the long term. I said, let me be real clear. You want to be around in the long term as a company? Then we got to execute in the short term. It's not an easy challenge, but you've got to make those trade-offs. But the way you make those trade-offs is, again, you have to have values and you have to have a criteria that, you, that enables you to make those trade-offs. And again, it's not perfect. It's not formulaic. But what I found is that Having that tension, you only have tension generally if you have a conscience. And you have a conscience if you have values and beliefs. Uh, so I think one of the things I say to people is, you know, until it's uncomfortable, you don't really know if you have character, <laughs> right? I would say people, for me, reputations are made in times of challenge and crisis. So when things are going well, we all know. A lot of people go around, look, I'm really terrific. Let me see how you are when you're flat down on the mat, whether you can get back up. And so that's, that's how I try to make those trade-offs. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Peter. Uh, is your, in your capacity as a director of Facebook, are you at all concerned about Facebook privacy practices over the years? So here's what I, unfortunately, because as a board member, I can't comment publicly, but let me say generally. Uh, I can't comment about Facebook specifically, but let me say generally. I believe very strongly in the need to have appropriate privacy guidelines uh, because information is the new currency, and there has to be a, le a level of trust around that information. Thank you. Oh, I was just about to uh, ask why it was a light over there and no light over here, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's good that it has yeah. come on. Uh, Ken, we know that, and I'm sure that you will admit to the fact that uh, racism in this country is institutionalized. Mm -hmm. It's built into just about every fabric of economics, pol politics, religion, et cetera. It doesn't escape there. Um, as the leader of one of the largest credit companies in the world, it is not any mistake that uh, racism was in the network in the way that you issued credit cards, credit, and other privileges to people around the world. How were you able to, say, root out or neutralize how your credit departments determined who was eligible or not eligible without applying that white privilege or racist discriminatory uh, uh, guideline to that? Yeah, I think the key thing there is you need to make sure, obviously, you have the processes in place, but then as you evaluate, you need to make sure there's not bias in the system. And so part of what you have to look at is are different groups disproportionately impacted 
by different policies or processes or uh, um, procedures. And that's something that we monitored closely and I know is continuing there because it goes back to, and what's interesting, I will tell you, um, people associate, excuse me, um, Amex with high-end customers, and in fact, we're more broad-based. But what's interesting, I'll give you one insight, is that um, black folk are at a disproportionate level for Amex cards. You know why? Because what they feel is, when we've done the qualitative research, when they pull out a card, and particularly the more premium card they pull out, the establishment will treat them better. And so they use it almost as a defensive mechanism to say, all right, I need all the help I can get uh, because I don't know how I'm going to be treated when I go to a retailer or a restaurant. But if I show them I got this Amex card, they might treat me somewhat better. Uh, so we have not had that issue at all. And the reality is, in the society we live in, rest assured, if we had the issue, we would have been sued. Um, and I think that would have been a good thing. Uh, so it's something that we monitor very carefully. Thank you. All right. Uh, good afternoon, Clayton and Ken. I'm Tyree Jones, class of 82. Terrific. Um, and I wish there were more members of the class of 82. This is really special. Mm. I'm wondering if you could speak more to the experiences that you had here at Bowdoin that you drew upon as you charted your course. Um, I've heard today several times how special this place can be. And so I'd like to hear more. You mentioned professors, you mentioned your thesis, but over that four year period, what were some of the other experiences you had that let you know too that you were marrying your authentic self with a community that may not have reflected the same values or welcomed you? Because that seemed to continue throughout the 70s and 80s and seems to speak to inclusion sure. as well. So I think very importantly, first and foremost, were my classmates. And uh, I'd really give a, a shout out to that group that was there in the 70s, uh, and certainly my class, the class of 73. Uh, but that group in the 70s, I think um, we came from all different walks of life. Uh, and uh, we certainly felt alienated at times. Uh, but there was a, there was a real genuine community uh, that was at Bowdoin. And, uh, you know, two of uh, the people who are very close friends of mine, Jeff Canada and George Caldoun, you know, as people will say in New York, uh, you got to go through one of us. <laughs> uh, and the reality is that bond is strong. But I will tell you, Throughout our class, um, we, had, we had a really um, a group of individuals who wanted each other to succeed and banded together. And that was, that was really important. So uh, what I would emphasize is that um, I came along at a time where civil rights, the Vietnam War, black power, I mean, all of that was coalescing. And we were, th we were together in Brunswick, Maine. So our group, <laughs> our group was, how many did we have? I'm trying to think, was it 50 or 40 we had? 30? But 30 from 71 to 75? was probably a little bit more, I would think. 65, yeah, 65. Wow. So uh, one of the things is we had critical mass to yeah, an extent. We didn't have that. <laughs> yeah, and, and I will tell you, that, that made a fundamental difference. It made a fundamental difference. And uh, I will tell you, when I came back in the 80s, uh, I was a little bit surprised that the percentage, and disappointed, that the percentage had gone down. But I will tell you, you know, I think, and I know he's here, Barry Mills did, 
I think, an incredible job, very strong commitment to diversity and inclusion. Uh, Clayton is doing that. I think there is a real push, and uh, I am uh, heartened uh, by that focus. And I do think this gathering, which shouldn't just be a one-time event, and the issue is how we build off the power in this room uh, to really be a support uh, network uh, for people, I think is something that we do need to think about. Yeah. You want to uh, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we yeah. talked a little bit about it uh, this morning. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I would just uh, tell you that I, I feel, when I say Bowdoin changed my life, I really do mean that. And what was absolutely critical in that was the community uh, at Bowdoin. And uh, those 65 people uh, made a big difference. And uh, for me, the, the other activity, I mean, I still, uh, I ran track and I played soccer. And um, <laughs> absolutely. But I will tell you this, I didn't like running around the track with snow in May. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you that. I didn't like that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll just actually cite, and this is a little bit out of order, but I do think it's important, um, is one of the sweet mates I had with George Caldoun was Gurma Asmaran. And Gurma was uh, on the Ethiopian uh, national team. Uh, he, was, he was really good. And, um, and when we talk about activists, as Gurma said to me, he said, I know you all think you're activists. He said, I'm an activist. <laughs> he said, but I'm putting my life on the line. And he went back to Ethiopia. And he was a revolutionary. He was in the jungle for years, <laughs> fighting. And then he became an ambassador to the US. Uh, and he died in 2016. And uh, Gurma really represented uh, a number of people that were making a commitment and a sacrifice. And I think sometimes we forget those who don't have a strong voice. And so the point that I always make is uh, the people I salute are people like Gurma. Because he wasn't, it wasn't about him. Uh, it was about his people. Uh, and I think if we had more people who had that attitude that they were going to be about the people, we'd be much better off. Thank you. So I am uh, uh, unfortunately going to end this. I know there are more questions, and I apologize for that, but we're running over. I took the presidential prerogative. It's so awesome to have that power. And, um, <laughs> I want to come to thank Ken in just a second, but I do want to uh, remind folks that um, immediately following this, there is a, a, a bit on the heels of what you said, Ken, uh, um, an event on Bowdoin today uh, in Moulton Union uh, with Dean uh, Odomaji. Didn't do it right again. Sorry, Christina. I'm just going to call her Christina. But, um, and Praise Hall from the class of 20, and a remarkable conversation that will go on there. Um, Ken, uh, thank you. This has been a remarkable conversation, uh, deep insights, and, and thank you for all that you do more generally, and thank you for all that you do for Bowdoin, and thank you for being here for the weekend. So, thank, thank you. you. Thank all you, Clayton. Right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.